Hello, welcome to this talk on power from fusion. Uh, tonight's event has been arranged by British Pugwash and hosted by the Institute of Materials, Minerals and Mining. I'm Ian Crossland. Uh, the Institute is, a, what the Institute is about is no mystery, it's all in the name, but some of you may not have heard of British Pugwash. So simply put, it is the UK arm of an organization called the International Conferences on Science and World Affairs, uh, known informally as International Pugwash, because its first meeting was, was in 1957, held in Pugwash, Nova Scotia. This organization worked with both sides during the Cold War with the aim of reducing the risk of nuclear conflict. Amongst other things, it helped to establish the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the Conventions on Chemical and Biological Weapons. Our founder, uh, Sir Joseph Rotblatt, and International Pugwash were jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1995. Today, Pugwash continues to explore measures to improve international security. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> to improve international security and stability, including energy security, which brings us to this evening's talk. So I guess you can hear me, can you? Yes. Okay, that's good. So on Earth, power from fusion was first demonstrated with the explosion of the first hydrogen bomb, Ivy Mike, in 1952. But despite intensive investigations over six decades, a method of har harnessing fusion energy in a productive way has so far been elusive. The jibe from my end, the fission end of the nuclear business, was that fusion power was always 30 years away. But so suddenly we have developers promising practical fusion power within the next 10 or 15 years. And we have governments and even private investors putting money into new fusion devices. So can fusion power really help us to fight the climate battle or is it a minor skirmish at the margin an irrelevance? And I can think of no one who can answer these questions better than our speaker this evening. Professor Sir Ian Chapman is an internationally recognized expert on nuclear fusion. He's CEO of the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority and heads one of the world's leading fusion research teams. He's based at Cullen, home of the joint European Taurus, JET, which holds the record for energy generated in a controlled fusion reaction. So a warm welcome to you, Sir Ian, and it's, please take the floor, it's over to you. Okay, thank you, Ian. Right, slightly odd. The lecturer in me wants to stand up and walk about, but I'll try to do this sitting down. Um, so thanks for coming, those in the room, and thanks. Good to see you online. Um, yeah, lots of sort of promise and bluster about fusion. I hope that I'll give you a sort of run through of uh, state of play of where we really are. Um, I, I like to start with some images about climate change. Um, because I think we're far too glib, really, about um, what's required to get to net zero by 2050. So just a few slides to depress you to start with. This is all stuff that you'll know, right? Um, this was Washington State three or four years ago, um, wildfires all over the state. Um, and this image sums up to me how people are really thinking about the, the effects of climate change, where somehow we normalize the fact that half of the state is on fire and that becomes a new normal and we go and play golf and just forget about this existential threat which is hanging over us. Um, and, and, and that's really not acceptable. This is some, um, some data that was released by NASA last year. Um, I think it's really interesting about the timescales for how energy affect the climate. So this is the global average temperature um, normalized to a baseline of 1900. Um, so globally averaged across the seasons. And you can see this is a phenomenally boring graph for the first 100 years. Nothing changes. There's a few excursions here or there, but it's all staying within a, uh, you know, less than half a, half a degree of, uh, of the baseline. So nothing's really happening. We're burning quite a lot of coal at this stage and, and now burning oil and gas as well, but nothing's really happening, nothing's changing. Um, and this just shows you the inertia in the system, really. Um, by the, the early 90s, it's beginning to change. And then from 2000, that's when you really see the effect of climate change kicking in. Um, but there's 100 years of putting carbon into the atmosphere before anything really changes. And I think this 
this slice shows that very clearly where not a lot for a long period of time and then all of a sudden you see that you know you've put the lid on the pan turn the gas on it's taking a while for the water to heat up now all of a sudden it's beginning to bubble and you're seeing rather extreme things happening um, and that's um, both depressing um, but also I think sobering about how you know the changes that we can make to the energy system will also have a lot of inertia in the system so bringing things back under control is pretty difficult um, another thing that I that frustrates me a lot is how glib people are particularly in Whitehall about the notion of getting to net zero by 2050 um, this is a pretty depressing graph, but one that you will have seen many, many times. This is what we burn globally today, where our energy consumption comes from. And you can see 80% of it is from burning fossil fuels. Um, we burn nearly 50% more fossil fuels now than we did in 2000, when I showed you that graph started to take off on the temperature. So, I mean, that in itself is, is pretty depressing. Um, if, if you just consider, I mean, this is all going north, right? So it's all it's all going up and consumption goes up and will continue to go up. And, and that's right and proper. We should expect the, the developing world to want to use more energy and global population goes up. So all of that is, is obvious um, and it's only going further north. But let's assume it didn't. Let's just assume that to get to net zero by 2050, we just had to displace the carbon that we're burning today. Get rid of that. OK, that's a big enough challenge. So the, the red, the orange and the black here. That's about 11 gigatons of oil equivalent. Okay, that's roughly what we burn as a global population. So 11 gigatons of oil to get rid of by 2050. So 2050 is roughly speaking 11,000 days away. You've got roughly speaking 11,000 megatons of oil to get rid of. Okay, so you don't have to be a genius to say, let's just get rid of a megaton of oil every day. So what's a megaton of oil? Megaton of oil is roughly speaking size well. So the biggest nuclear power station in this country or Hornsea, the biggest offshore wind farm in the world. You have to build one of them every single day for 30 years. And in big handfuls, either one of those projects is roughly speaking 10 billion. Uh, so that's roughly 4% of global GDP. So that's the spending we should be spending to deal with the problem that we know we have, let alone the problem we might have. So we've got to spend roughly speaking 4% of global GDP and build a nuclear power station every single day for 30 years just to get rid of the fossil fuels we burn today. We're not doing that. Um, we're not close. To doing that right so let's not be glib about saying we'll get to net zero by 2050 um and and we really shouldn't think of this in this country in the uk as um you know just thinking about parochial uh solutions which work in the uk i mean who cares right we're less than one percent of the global energy market us being net zero and being ever so pious about it makes no difference so let's not think in that way we're a small windy island with a shallow seabed. We should do offshore wind and we should do it at scale. We're a nuclear state. We should do new nuclear, right? We can do those things. That might that might just about work for us, but it doesn't work for most jurisdictions. And so it would actually solve the problem. It's like having a COVID vaccine for the UK and then being pious about why nobody else is vaccinated. It, it's a nonsense, right? It doesn't work. You have to have a solution which works everywhere. Um, and so that's where I think fusion comes into this. Um, fusion has lots and lots of technical challenges to overcome, and I will talk about them. But if we can make it happen, it has huge potential as pretty much the only thing which can help us deal with some of the hard to abate sectors and can work in all jurisdictions. So, um, again, I say to government officials, you could do a lot worse than take policy advice from Stephen Hawking. Um, and he was asked, what do you want to see humanity implemented? This is the last page of his last ever book. Um, and he said, this is easy. I'd like to see fusion. And there's lots of reasons. And I think you know these or else you wouldn't be at this talk. Um, fusion is inherently low carbon, um, it's inherently safe, there is no risk of a chain reaction, it just can't happen, physics tells you it can't happen. If we can make it work, it would be reliable in the sense that it doesn't wait for seasonal variation or weather variation. Um, it's sustainable, we get our raw materials from seawater, of which we have plenty, and lithium, and on the scale that we need lithium, we also have plenty. And it's incredibly energy dense, in fact the most energy dense thing that you can do. But it is very hard. And one of the primary reasons that it's very hard is that to make fusion happen, that fusion happens in our sun, it's the root cause of pretty much all of our energy and our stars. But there you have the, the gravitational force of the mass of the sun forcing the light elements close enough to fuse. We, um, we obviously cannot recreate the mass of the sun here on Earth. And so we have to make our fuel even hotter than the center of the sun, about 10 times hotter than the center of the sun for fusion to happen here on Earth. So that's a big challenge, but it's not, in fact, the biggest. Um, 
We do that in a device called the Tokamak. I will talk about other approaches to fusion as well, but I'll mainly talk about Tokamaks um, as they are the most advanced. Um, so the, the fusion fuel here, the pink donut, is held by very large magnets, which create this enormous for this, this confining field, allowing the fuel to be at about 150 million degrees, not touch the wall, because obviously it would melt the wall. Um, this, this was a Soviet invention in the 70s. Um, so that's 50 years ago, and these lights are still not powered by fusion power. So we still have technical challenges to overcome. So in the interest of balance, because I'm a balanced scientist, I've said one positive thing from Hawking. Let's look at a negative thing from Walter Marshall. Um, who said there'll come a time when we sustain a fusion reaction. Tick. Um, then there'll come a time when we get as much energy from a fusion reactor as we put in. Well, some would contend. Tick, but maybe not. However, there'll never come a time when we get as much money out as we have put in. And that, for me, is, is the really important thing. I mean, it's, it's all well and good having a technology, but if nobody wants to buy it, I mean, uh, what benefit is that to humanity? So um, I hope you come away from this talk thinking that at least one group of people are actually thinking about how we commercialize it and how we make fusion a reality. So on the, the uh, have we achieved fusion, um, there was lots of, um, lots of press around results from the National Ignition Facility in the US um, just before Christmas, where they get a thermal gain. So the, the, the energy which comes out of the lasers to initiate the fusion reaction um, was about two megajoules, and that produced about three megajoules of fusion energy now. That in and of itself is a very tiny amount of energy. Um, now, you could say that's that's a thermal gain, right? So it's an impressive milestone, and it is a phenomenally impressive piece of science. Um, unfortunately, there was about 300 megajoules went in at the back end of the laser to produce two megajoules into the fuel. So it is definitely not um, a commercially viable product yet. There is plenty, plenty to do on that pathway. But nonetheless, some really encouraging breakthroughs in science. So um, I thought I would start with um, what are the big challenges that we have to overcome? What are the technical hurdles that we have to get to get to this point, to get to a working fusion power plant? Um, I think it breaks down to five big technical challenges, and that is pretty much how my organization is set up. So I will talk about those five challenges and then tell you what we're doing to address them. So the first and, and kind of the one that people know is that the fuel has to be hot in the center of the sun. This is real footage from JET, which is the biggest fusion device in the world today. That fuel is 150 million degrees. So we can do that. Um, and only when you get to that sort of temperature do you get a good cross section between here a deuteron, so heavy hydrogen, whizzing around the inside of the machine at huge energies. And it has a decent then cross section and reaction rate with a triton, very heavy hydrogen. They fuse, they force together, fuse them, produce helium, it's just an inert gas as a byproduct, and neutrons. And the neutrons are actually what we collect to produce electricity. And um, they're great for producing electricity in that they're very high energy, very high flux, very high fluence. So that's really good for electrical yield, but it's really bad for whatever you've built the machine from. So you will have in a fusion power plant the most intense neutron source on the planet. And as those neutrons stream through the steel or whatever you've built the machine from, they will cause displacements in the lattice of the material of that steel. Right, we're in the Institute of Materials, but we know all about the fact that these displacements will cause changes in the properties of that steel, its, it's brittleness, its creep, its strength, how long it lasts, and that really affects the cost of the consumer. As well as the most intense neutron source, you also have incredible heat gradients to deal with. So the bit in the middle, it kind of sounds crazy that's 150 million degrees. Now, in some senses, that's the easy bit. The hard bit is that the wall at the edge has to be less than a few thousand degrees or it melts. And then immediately behind the wall, you have magnets which are cryogenically cooled to four Kelvin. So you've gone from 10 times hotter than the sun to almost absolute zero in two meters. So heat management is a big challenge and a big deal. The, uh, the fourth challenge is our fuel. Deuterium you just take from seawater, piece of cake. Um, tritium is uh, radioactive. It's a half-life of about 12 years. You do not find any natural tritium as long as it's decayed. So you have to make it. And this is meant to represent a blanket of lithium around the outside of the machine. Neutrons come out, pass through the lithium, and some will react and produce tritium. So far, so good. You then have to take that molten salt out into a processing plant. And it's not hugely complicated, but it's quite, quite big and expensive processing plant, which then extracts the tritium, separates it from the proteum and the deuterium, freezes the tritium, cryogenically freezes it into small little pellets, and then you fire those pellets in. So it's put wood on the fire, it keeps burning. Stop putting wood on the fire. Within about 10 seconds, it stops burning. So it's very easy to stop. And you can do all of those four things 
if you only run for half the year, the cost of the consumer would be chronic and no one would ever buy it. So you need to be, you need to be able to maintain the machine and have high uptime, high availability. Produce neutrons, things get hot. And so we need to send in robots. You need to have high neutrons in the vision station where you just think you're a bot. You need to have because we send in a robot. Um, there's lots of architecture on the inside and some of it will melt, some of it will crash. So those are sort of the five big technical challenges that we face before we get to a want. Now, what my is <coughs> that will, in terms of running and understanding fuels, we do, we have <laughs> UK tools. It's just has another ideal test bed for exploring from power plants. Then the neutrons which affect the materials, we have a materials research facility, which is for looking at how neutrons affect materials. And we are building a component test facility in Yorkshire, which will test full components. So sort of my size, two meters by a meter. So you can look at brazes and welds and full components under magnetic flux, under high heat flux in a vacuum. Nothing else like that. We are currently building a facility called Heat, which will be the biggest tritium storage processing and research facility anywhere um, and that's for looking at how you store tritium how you account for it process it separate it detritiate from materials and, and solids and we now have about 400 roboticists in our robotic center race which are looking at how you maintain and um, and robotically handle components and then we stitch all of that together into some pretty complicated um, in silico models to be able to do computing design of power plants that will follow and I'll tell you about one of those later. So I thought, um, before I go into the technical challenges, I thought you'd probably be interested to know what government policy is on this around the world. Well, the UK government actually were the first to publish a fusion strategy. By hook or by crook, we have the biggest fusion organization in the world in the UK. Um, and the government published a fusion strategy two years ago, um, which has two key goals. First of all, build a prototype power plant. And second of all, make some economic benefit from that, have an industry which can export it. As I say, fusion is not about domestic energy policy in this country. We don't need it. You know, we can do fission, we can do wind, and that's probably in storage as a solution for us. But that doesn't work in most countries. So this is about finding a solution which works in most countries. To use a slightly tired analogy of the uh, COVID vaccine, this is the AstraZeneca approach, right? Rather than being first to market, that was Pfizer, AstraZeneca said, well, we're going to try and have an approach which works in all jurisdictions and doesn't need special cooling and can be used in Africa and blah, blah, blah. And they now have 55% market share because they took that approach, trying to find a solution to everybody. And so we're trying to find a solution which works in all jurisdictions here. Um, the, the EU um, have had a long and concerted fusion programme. Indeed, it's the genesis of most of what happens in the UK now. It was originally European funded. Um, and they have a comprehensive roadmap to how to get to power plants. I would describe that as an evidence-driven approach. So serially saying, well, first of all, build ETA, more on that in a minute, and then we'll build some test components, test facilities to test components of materials, and then we'll build a prototype power plant, and then we'll build power plants. So it's all very serial and the lowest risk approach, and that frankly drives the timeline quite a way to the right. The US is kind of in the opposite place where they are trying to be extremely aggressive on this. The, the White House held a summit last year um, and published what they call a decadal vision for fusion. Um, and they are putting considerable sums of money, particularly after the National Ignition Facility um, results just before Christmas. Um, most latterly, they've announced um, a public-private partnerships program, which essentially doubles the money of any private investor. So a private investor will say, well, we'll build a pilot plant, and then it's milestone based, a bit like the, the SpaceX approach for NASA and the Department of Energy will double their money. Um, so they are being increasingly aggressive about fusion and making available their national lab network. Um, and China, um, China are into a big international collaboration called ITER, which I will tell you about. They have a 9% stake in that and have access to 100% of the IP. And so their approach is essentially to take the ITER design and build it and build it and build it and try to drive down price through volume and frankly they're just about the only country that can do that because they do have the need for volume um, they are in parallel building in the bottom left um, a suite of technology testing facilities which sort of replicate what you find in the uk and what you find in europe 
and they are they now have a site for a, um, a pilot plant which they're aiming to complete by 2040. So turning back to the UK, um, what are we doing in this field? Well, first of all, we, we aim to have technical leadership. Um, then we aim to show that fusion is practical and that we have a way of doing that at a cost competitive price. And then we, we also aim to have an industry which can exploit that, that beneficial design. Now, rather than doing, in some senses, you try to do those serially, right? So show fusion as possible, then show it's practical and would be cost competitive and then actually commercialize it kind of how fission was right in, on that basis but the existential threat is so large that we're parallelizing up this so working on can we have a commercial product at the same time as trying to tackle some of the technical pro problems and that's a risky approach but i think necessarily necessary approach so let me go through those those three things i'm going to come back to the five technical challenges that i outlined at the start and say a little bit about what we're doing on each so the first is how you can find a very hot fuel this is a a fly through a jet, you'll see a person in coveralls in a minute to give you some sense of scale. Um, jet is the largest fusion magnetic fusion device in the world today. So there's a person on the screen. Um, it's sort of industrial scale plant. It's the only machine that can handle tritium on the scale that you need for a power plant. It's the only machine with the same mixture of metals that you would use in a power plant. The only machine with a robotic maintenance system, the only machine of its size, right? So it's just unique. Um, and um, at, around this time last year, we announced that we've broken the world record for fusion energy released. Again, in, a, in and of itself, um, not, not a, um, a transformative thing, but it shows that we our predictions are right. So we predicted what would happen way in advance and then did what we said we would do. We did um, deuterium and tritium in JET. So JET held the world record from 1997 for fusion energy output, the red curve, and then same machine, but just improved our learning. We've now more than doubled that in the, the blue and the, the pink curves last year. Um, but it's still a massive consumer of power. So if you look down at the bottom, a power plant needs a, a big chunk of electricity, recirculating electricity to run it. That puts some thermal heating into the power, into the fuel, and then produces a lot more power out. So you get a net gain. That's what you're aiming to do in a power plant. The next device, ETA, which I'll show you in just a second, kind of nets out. So the power required to operate, electrical power required to operate, is about the same as the thermal power out. But in JET, we need a gigawatt to operate and produce 10 megawatts out, right? So it's a massive consumer of power. So whilst this world record is important because it agrees with our predictions and it gives us confidence that we know what's going to happen in next stage devices, it's obviously not um you know on the verge of delivering fusion power because we're still a massive consumer but our predictions were validated and that gives us confidence as we go forward to build the next step device which will show a thermal gain and that's what this machine is all about this is a facility called ITER. it happens to be the largest scientific collaboration ever undertaken by humanity um, and the aim here is to put 50 megawatts thermal power in to get fusion happening and produce 500 megawatts thermal power out. So show a big net gain, 10 times net gain. Um, to give you some sense of scale, the building in the middle, you see my cursor, is about 80 meters across, about 120 meters long and about 80 meters tall. Um, so it's a very big facility. My, my slightly tired joke now is that it's, it's like Wembley, scale of Wembley. And a bit like Wembley, it's twice over budget and twice behind schedule. Um, it's more complicated than a football stadium. So it's first of a kind. And as well as being first of a kind and incredibly complex, it is also geopolitically a nightmare. So the partners are down here, if you're good with flags. This really is a project where China and the US are working together and Europe and Russia are working together. So it, it is interesting geopolitically. I'm actually amazing that the project is still going, but it is still going and all the partners are still participating. Um, it's now 80% built, so it turns on in just a few years' time. It has plenty of engineering challenges to overcome yet, but it is a real thing which is really happening. And actually, I'll show you a video of it um, to give you some sense of scale. Oh, say I'll show you a video of it, but it doesn't want to work. Oh, how annoying. That must be something to do with all these cables because it definitely works. Um, anyway, go on ETA.org and have a look at some of the videos. They are phenomenal. Um, to, to show you scale anyway, this is a four hectare switchyard. Um, this 
this winding facility is 120 meters long. It builds superconducting magnets, which are 26 meters across, biggest magnets ever built. Um, here's the biggest ACDC distribution center in Europe, the largest cryogenics plant in the world. It's just a phenomenal piece of engineering. Um, I, I'll give you one statistic. The magnet which goes down the middle of ETA, which is the biggest magnet ever made, produces a magnetic impulse equivalent to the weight of an aircraft carrier. Just get your head around that. That's like equivalent to putting a magnet over an aircraft carrier, lift it out of the ocean. Crazy, crazy piece of engineering, but it but it now exists, right? Um, the second challenge that we talked about was how the neutrons and the very high flux, very high energy neutrons affect the wall. Now, each one of those neutrons will cause a displacement. That in and of itself is not a problem, but those displacements can cause knock-ons and can cause what we call sort of cascades that, that, or dislocations through the, prop, through the material. And as those dislocations propagate, they will lead to swelling. They will lead to cracking for sure. And that really affects the lifetime of the plant. And now, if the armor on the front lasts for five years, that's probably fine. But if it lasts for five months, it's probably not fine. Um, and we don't know. So we're having to rely on simulations of that. There is no way of replicating the conditions of a fusion power plant until you've built a fusion power plant. So we are just frankly going to be carrying that risk the whole way through until we, we have built a test, until we have built a prototype. But it is a serious risk because because there is we know for sure that the materials will swell and crack we just don't know how long they'll last the other things which happen are that you get transmutations in the elements so what we put in in the armor say pure tungsten to start with as those displacements happen the, the chemical properties and, and the mixture will change and you'll get different isotopes appearing you'll get in that tungsten you'll get quite a lot of rhenium and osmium and various other things we also produce helium when when we produce when fusion happens right produces helium that helium then gets embedded into the material and that will cause embrittlement it will cause swelling um so lots and lots of changes in the material pro properties and and it is very hard to simulate because of all of these combinatorial loads of the heat of the helium embrittlement of the neutron load of the causing of fuzz and dust and and flaking of the material all of that is really really hard to simulate um, and so there will be significant uncertainty of how long components will last um, we are however doing some testing so a few years ago we built this facility it's called the materials research facility where we can put structural materials so steel or tungsten things in test reactors now those test reactors are either low energy high fluence I mean fission reactors basically or high energy low fluence so there's no way of replicating the high energy high fluence. Um, but we can test components. We then put them through our hot cells, cut them up into small samples, and then do micromechanical tests. Um, and we have about 20 different instruments now for micromechanical testing. We are also building some hot cells to do meso scale testing of a few centimeters to see whether scaling from microns to centimeters, which is a you know six decades, then allows you to extrapolate with more confidence to what meter scale things might look like. So that is that is happening at the moment. We're building that extension now. The third challenge that we talked about was exhausting extreme heat, and it is really extreme heat. So the bit in the middle is 150 million degrees. Now, like, I don't know, air over an airplane wing, water down a pipe, lo and behold, you've put a lot of energy into something which is 100 times thinner than air, and it also experiences turbulence. So the hot bit in the material, which is where fusion is happening in the middle, will undergo a random walk, stochastic walk, and get out to the edge through turbulent processes. Now, we don't just let it go out and hit the wall. We use magnets to sweep it down to a sacrificial surface at the bottom, and that's a consumable. So that will melt over time, and you just have to replace it every few years. And you can see that in the, the IR, the infrared image of jet here, where all the heat is going down at the bottom here. Now, in a power plant, the heat down at the target here could be sort of 50 megawatts a square meter. For context, that's like arc welder. Right, so it's really, really high heat flux, certainly up well above a re-entrant space shuttle, things that are designed to melt the blade. So it's a really, really challenging heat exhaust problem. So how do we go about that? Well, conventionally, and I will talk about a better design later, but conventionally, this is just inertial cooling. So you have an armor, maybe tungsten, big heat flux on it, and then you have a, a coolant going through it at extremely high flow rates. So um, a conventional machine like jet or eater would be designed with a copper chrome zirconium pipe and a coolant going through that. Um, now, 
we did a sort of optimization of that actually borrowing techniques from aerospace and we tried lots of different ways of additively manufacturing that with sort of tungsten fuzz or tungsten felt metals um they didn't really work so we ended up putting little fins uh between the interlayer and the armor because they have different thermal conductivity they expand at different rates so um we then so we fabricated a component like that and rather than just putting that into a test bed we then do in silico x-ray tomography of it and we found some some flaws in the the welds and the braze here so we tested that um, virtually um the one on the left is the um is the actual and the one on the right is the design um, and you can see that whilst the, the the stresses and strains are not actually worse in the actual compared to the design it's the same sort of color of red if you look at the top bit of the armor here it's moving only a millimeter or so but it is moving at the top because of the difference in thermal expansion um, and that millimeter which sticks out will then get all of the heat will hit that tiny little corner which is exposed and it'll just melt so you'll then end up with molten tungsten running around the inside of your machine, which is not a great place to be. So instead of putting that in a heat flux test facility, we just redesigned it. So we came up with a better way of manufacturing it, and then it worked fine. And then we put it in a heat, a heat flux facility where we cycled it at 20 megawatts a square meter for hundreds of cycles and found that it worked fine. And it could cope with that sort of heat flux, which, as I say, is well above the melt point because of the, the rapid cooling. Um, so it's sort of, you know, keeping an ice cube in an oven. Um, so um, it is possible. It's hard, but it is possible. Now, um, that's small scale samples. We're now looking at how you build full scale samples. So we are building a, a combined magneto thermal hydraulic test facility, which will have a four Tesla magnetic field on a component, as I say, is about my size, two meters by a meter under extremely high heat flux in a vacuum. So that combined load that you see in a fusion power plant. So this is building it up. We have inertial heating. We then also have spot heating, the, 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 the highest, at least not for weapons applications, for civil applications, the highest continuous wave power laser in the world, which puts spot heating on the surfaces, a very large magnetic field, which both does static and pulsed to simulate off normal events. Um, and that whole thing is being fabricated at the moment. It should be operational end of next year. Um, and it, it's unique. There's nothing else like that in the world. And it allows you to test combined loads, but it doesn't have the neutrons. So we're not doing full combined loads. We're doing everything except the neutrons. Um, coming on to the fourth challenge, which is about tritium and how we handle it. Um, so deuterium and tritium fuse, they produce helium and neutrons. The neutrons then pass through a blanket of lithium. And preferentially, we want lithium-6. Now, most lithium is lithium-7. It's about 7% lithium-6, 93% lithium-7 naturally. So we will have to enrich some of our lithium, maybe about 40% of it up to lithium-6. So that that neutron then reacts with the lithium, produces more helium and a triton. You then take that triton and freeze it and re-inject it. But that's not a hugely easy thing to do. So we have built this facility. It's a facility called HEAT. It's now up and operational. Um, and in it, we do full closed loop tritium cycle. So storage on a metal hydride bed, um, production of pellets, cryogenic cooling of the um, tritium gas into solid, extrusion into ice, injection into vacuum, combining with other gases, then separation and taking the hydrogen and then isotopically separating that into proteum, deuterium, and tritium, and then putting the tritium back into storage. So the full loop and the accountancy of where the tritium is at all points. Tritium, like all hydrogen, is a nightmare to confine. Um, it permeates through things, it embrittles, it cracks, it's explosive, it's quite hard to handle. Um, and tritium is also radioactive. So it's not a great thing to have to work with, um, but um, we now have, we now can do that. So we have pretty sophisticated accountancy tools, which allows us to know where the tritium is and handle it and, and, and handle it safely and know exactly where it is in the, in the cycle at all times. Then the fifth challenge is how we maintain the machine. Um, and as I said, we need big robots to do that. So this is the robotic maintenance system on the inside of Jet. It's a 10 meter long boom arm. Um, the, the user sits 50 feet away from the manipulators at the end of the robot. So well outside the loop, but always user in the system. It's all in haptic force feedback. So what the user um, does, the robot does, what the robot feels, the user feels. It's so sophisticated that the user could run the finger of the robot along the wall 
and sort of feel this. So feel a piece of sellotape or less than a millimeter drop. You'd feel that in your hand, even though you're sat 50 feet away. And at the same time, it's high payload. So you can pick up hundreds of kilos. So you can do um, very, very dexterous manipulation and also pick up high payloads. And there's frankly nothing else that, that combines those things. Um, and that has obviously applications in lots of other sectors as well. Um, at the same time as building big room robots for manipulating things on the inside, there's a whole load of stuff that needs to be done on the outside. And so we are developing um, control systems, um, user interfaces, software, which can be applied to very different types of robots, drones, ground-based robots, big boom robots, same user interface, same control software on the middle layer sitting in between. Um, and that actually will massively reduce the number of users that we need to maintain the machine, because you will need lots of very different types of robots. Um, so this is a very sort of active area, and again, spillovers into lots of different sectors. Um, now let me talk about how we make fusion practical. So look, there are technical challenges that we have to overcome. Any fusion power plant will have to overcome those five things before it works. And pretty much none of them do we have complete solutions yet? So they are all active areas of, of um, research, but in parallel, we're thinking about how do we commercialize this? Now that very big machine eater, I'm sure it will work. I think it will produce 500 megawatts. It's a massive, massively complicated piece of engineering and it will be late and it will be over budget, but I think it will do what it was designed to do. But it's gonna be upwards of 20 billion to produce 500 megawatt thermal. Nobody's ever gonna buy that. Ever, right? So, so you need to find a way of driving down the capital cost. Um, and much cleverer people that came before me realized that it is a necessary thing. We need to show a game. But at the same time, we also need to think of a way of making a much lower capital cost building. Um, and if you look at where the money goes in ETA, roughly speaking, big handfuls, a third of the money goes in these massive superconducting magnets and cryogenics to cool them. And a third of the money goes in very, very large buildings, nuclear gr concrete grade buildings. So that's roughly speaking 12 billion in those two. So if you can use smaller magnets and put them in a smaller building, you can strip out billions of cost and actually then approach an overnight capital cost, which would lead to a cost of electricity that the consumer might buy. So that's a nice idea, right? You can think, well, okay, I'll just make my machine change the magnetic geometry, make it smaller, squeeze the fuel very close to the magnets, and that will strip out costs from the from the magnets in the buildings. And that is the genesis of the so-called spherical tokamak. So ETA, JET, they're conventional ring donuts, right? So shaped like that. You've paid for an enormous amount of money for this magnet, which fits, sits down the middle. 12 and a half Tesla you produce here. The fuel is out here, feels five and a half Tesla. So that's not hugely efficient. So, well, let's just move the fuel close to the magnet. And then you need a lot less on the coil to get the same fuel at the field on the inside. So it's a nice idea, squeeze it in. And, and we say it looks like a cord apple. So it looks spherical, very narrow gap down the middle. So, you know, theoretically, from a physics point of view, that is for sure a much more efficient way of using your magnets. And indeed, we came up with this idea, built the first ever spherical tokamak, showed that it was far more efficient. And largely, the rest of the world looked at that and said, yeah, yeah, nice idea. But if you build a power plant where you've squeezed something which is hotter than the sun into a smaller box, the chances of melting the walls are much higher. True, right? True. So nobody else really invested in this and followed this pathway because they said that the heat exhaust problem is hard enough. Let's not make it harder by trying to squeeze it into a smaller box. We said, we agree. If we don't find a way of extracting the heat here, this is a dead end. And, and there's no pathway forward. But if we, do, but frankly, if we can't take this pathway, then the capital cost is going to be so big that, that that normal fusion might also be a dead end. So we sort of railed against the machine and said, we're going to just have to find a solution. So um, actually working with some US colleagues, we came up with an idea for how we might do that. We um, convinced the government to part with some taxpayers' money to build a test of that. Uh, it took us about 10 years to build this facility, phenomenally piece of a normally complicated piece of engineering. It was the first, actually, first public project ever to win the Royal Academy of Engineering's Major Projects Award, because it is bloody complicated. Um, and we turned this machine on in 2021. Um, I'll describe very briefly what we're trying to do. So the hot bit in the middle is where fusion happens. As I say, some of it will undergo turbulence and get out to the edge. Now, in a conventional machine, we sweep that down to a sacrificial surface down here at the bottom, which gets hot and needs to be replaced. Now, if you build a compact machine with that, it will just melt. It's just, it won't handle the heat. 
So our clever ex heat extraction system, so this is like an exhaust on your car, um, sweeps the heat another 50 centimeters in, in sort of 2D. But in 3D, the particles are still going around and around. So it's still topologically toroidal. And so that 50 centimeters of real estate that you use to bolt on the exhaust pipe on your car actually buys you 20 meters of connection. And the whole time the particles move along that 20 meter path, they radiate, they cool down, so that by the time they actually get to the metal, they're a lot cooler, carrying a lot less energy. So that's sort of the premise. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that, actually, but that's the high level premise. We said that this is what we would achieve. So the red line is how ITER is designed. It's, how, frankly, how every other fusion design works. You get a narrow spot down here, about a centimeter across, with a very high heat density. So a lot of heat in a narrow area. With this new design, which is, doesn't take a lot of space, doesn't cost you a lot of money, we said our models, which we published this openly uh, more than 10 years ago, we said we can drop the heat, the peak heat flux to the wall by more than 10 times. And it's a pretty bold claim, this. If you say that you're going to be 10 times better than your competitors in, in any field, that's a real market advantage, not two times or two and a half times, 10 times better. Um, so this is a pretty bold claim to make. Um, and there was a bit of guffawing in the general community. Um, we uh, we turned it on in 2021, and these are our first results. And um, if you want to see experiment match modeling, I mean, frankly, you could do a lot worse than this. Um, and secondly, this tells me that A, it works, and B, we've got some, some predictive capability in our models. We can actually say how things will behave in power plant conditions. So this is really exciting on, on two regards. One, we can actually use our models to predict what happens in the future. And two, the system works and it really does extract the heat. And that really does allow you to conceive of a much smaller power plant. And this was a, a massive transformation really for me in our field, because now we can think about building power plants which don't cost 30, 25, 30 billion. Um, and we can drive down that capital cost. And, and frankly, without doing that, nobody would ever buy Fusion. We can come up with all the technological solutions we like, but nobody would buy it. The, uh, the Walter Marshall plan, right? So we needed to do that. I, um, I come back to my AstraZeneca analogy. They were trying to find not only something which didn't need cryogenic cooling, but something which everybody could afford. Um, and so we're trying to do the same thing here. The, the green here is the European eater like design of a power plant. The blue is our design. And you can see that in the things which really matter and drive the price, we're kind of a third of the price. So it's stripping out significant cost, capital cost, overnight cost from the plant. Now, how are we going to commercialize that? Well, um, we have a the government have seen this and they've they've realized that we really have a market advantage here. And so they are backing a program called the Spherical Tokamak, small machine for energy production. So we're aiming to produce net electricity. It won't be commercially viable, but net electricity. Um, it won't be available enough. It will need massive subsidy to start with. It's just a prototype, but we're mainly aiming to have a lower capital cost. So a better approach, lower capital cost than the other approaches to fusion. The government have now put about 250 million into this concept design phase, which finishes in spring next year. So in big handfuls, this is kind of the timeline we're working to, um, concept design phase till 2024. Then we go into detailed engineering design. You know, this pipe goes here. Um, we think that will probably take eight years. Um, then early 30s, we start construction and it'll take best part of a decade. It is big infrastructure. That's how long it takes. Aiming to complete the build by around 2040 and start commissioning then. In this first concept design phase, we said we'd do four things. We have a concept and take that to a, a, a maturity level. We said we'd develop a site. We said we'd set up a target operating model for how we how we take the program forward. And we said we'd set up a regulatory framework for fusion. I'm going to say a few, few words about those four things. So firstly, the site. Um, we ran a volunteer process. We had 15 nominations, really top to bottom, east to west of the country. Um, and then the government in October announced this is the site. It is uh, currently an EDF-owned coal power station operating in North Nottinghamshire. So this is the Trent. Um, but it has a oh, whoops. It has a lot of things that you will need at a power station. It has a direct connection to the 400 kilovolts. It has a substation. It has a two gigawatt abstraction license from the, the Trent. It has a train line. It has uh, you know all the connections to the grid, um, and it is huge. It's a 350 hectare site. You can fit comfortably three power stations on this site. Um, so we can really hit the ground running. That power station ceases operation in four weeks' time. 
at which point um, the coal power station, which is to the right of this picture, will be demolished. We think that will take, EDF actually think that will take about five years. Um, and in the, in the meantime, we will remediate the land to the left, which at the moment has a lot of spent coal ash on it, um, and start our infrastructure works um, that end of site. So there's huge potential, and we can really hit the ground running on this site, and it has a community and a workforce that, that, want, that want this project. On regulation, um, one of the reasons that ITER has been slow and expensive is that it's being regulated by ASN in France like a fission project. It is not a fission project, but it's being treated like a fission project. Fusion has radiological hazards. They are not the same as fission, and they are far from as extreme as fission because there is just no risk of a chain reaction. It can't happen in fusion. Um, and so that absence of a chain reaction means you just don't need the same protection systems that you have in fission. Um, and so we said to the government a few years ago, look, if we're really going to embark on a power plant program, you have to work out how fusion will be regulated. They tasked a body called the Regulatory Horizons Council, who are responsible for looking at new tech and how it might be regulated appropriately. So after fusion, they then looked at genomics and drones, things like that, right, new things. They, um, they produced a report a couple of years ago, which said you must have a proportionate pro-innovation approach. On the back of that, the government launched a green paper, so a consultation process. They had lots and lots of responses to that and have now, not quite a white paper, but come to a, a position statement, which is that fusion should have a bespoke and proportionate regulatory framework, which will be administered by the Environment Agency and the HSC, Health and Safety Executive, not the Office for Nuclear Regulation. So it will not be regulated like fusion in the UK. And that is going through the houses at the moment in the Energy Security Bill, which we expect to be in law by July. Um, you also need some money. Um, there's, as Ian said at the start, um, increasing market appetite for investment in fusion. This shows you the number of companies that have been born over the last few years. Um, over 5 billion invested in fusion startup companies now. If I'm honest, if I go back a few years, that was largely driven by philanthropy. Um, it's now, you see half a dozen oil and gas companies invested in fusion. Um, you see sovereign wealth funds invested in fusion, whole swathes of venture capitalists, even some pension funds invested in fusion, which amazes me. Um, but um, but a whole range of now investors. Interestingly, um, a significant number of these were born in the UK, utterly disproportionate number born in the UK. And even more interestingly, other companies have moved to the UK. So I don't know, General Fusion, for instance, Canadian company moving to the UK. Their next device will probably be a 300 million pound facility and it will be built here in the UK. Um, so that's literally moving around the world, bringing inward investment into this country because of our capability in fusion. Um, indeed, we are creating a cluster. This is our column campus. We have about 40 companies working alongside us, either in fusion or in adjacent technologies to fusion. This building up here will be the general fusion building. Um, and lots and lots of other buildings coming alongside. So this, this is going up at the moment, funded by pension fund money for another tenant on site. We've recently signed agreements with both First Light Fusion and Tokamak Energy, so two other fusion companies who will also be coming to our campus. So you are beginning to see a real fusion cluster happening here. And then if you're an investor who's thinking about getting involved in fusion, where do you go? You go to where all the companies are. So um, we're really hopeful that this will continue to drive inward investment into the UK. Um, and as a sign of real progress, right? So um, on the left-hand side, this is Commonwealth Fusion Systems. This is a spin out from MIT. Um, I talked about this really, really powerful magnet in ITER, which is huge. They produce a, a much smaller three meter magnet, but a three meter magnet, a 21 Tesla. It's an enormous magnetic field using high temperature superconductors. And it's a pretty, pretty reasonable sized magnet of three meters, 10 tons, proper magnet. There. Before that, high temperature superconducting magnets were about this big, you know, size of a pen finger size and they've built gone right to a three meter 10 ton magnet and produced a 21 tesla cross coil you know um that's transformative for magnetic fusion it's like um the, the analogy i use is um so so jet is a fire it's just a pile of wood turn it on um eater is kind of just a bigger fire just put more wood make it bigger it'll produce more thermal output but actually a, a much better way is to take your small fire and put some insulation around it turn it into a furnace then you get a hotter thermal burn that's what a high temperature superconducting magnet does. So it's like having a much stronger insulation, which means the same amount of fuel can produce higher thermal heat. Um, Tokamak Energy on the right-hand side, um, actually kind of a spin out from UKAA. 
They were the first private company to reach 100 million degrees, um, which is kind of fusion temperatures, which they did last year. So a major milestone for them. Uh, on the left here is general fusion. They take a very different approach to how you might do fusion. Um, they have done some lab bench tests in the bottom left and are now building a big scale um, experimental test of their sort of uh, vortex collapsing sort of like pistons basically. And another um, pulsed approach is being adopted by First Light Fusion. It's a spin out from Oxford University, as I say, they are coming to the Cullum campus too, um, who use rather than big lasers, they use projectiles to force a, a compression and they would need to do that at high frequency, um, like the car piston approach to producing fusion energy. So I hope that's a sort of whistle stop tour of what's going on in fusion. Um, I hope you found it interesting. Um, I would say that the sector is really uh, at an inflection point where we're seeing <coughs> governments with very concerted policies around fusion for the first time ever. We've seen some real big technical advances, so breaking world records. In my view, the, the, the results on heat exhaust from mast were transformative and a number of other things like those magnets I just talked about. Um, we have a proper power plant, prototype power plant design program and we're on track for that for a concept by next year and we are seeing proper industry engagement we now have about four and a half thousand suppliers so a much broader industrial base than than we had a few years ago and you are seeing oil and gas majors and other big engineering and energy firms getting involved in ETA, getting involved in fusion actually even putting their cash in so we are likely to see a big expansion of that as companies pivot to make fusion a part of their portfolio so um, it's a really exciting time in our field um, there is still a whack of technical risk, and I definitely cannot tell you that fusion will work, but I think we have a good chance. Thank you. I'm very happy to take questions. So how are we going to organise this? Um, <laughs> okay, so I think we'll start with questions in the room, and then when the, we get to uh, we exhaust the people here, we'll, we'll look online. Okay. Um. Richard Oblak, uh, I'm a fellow here. Um, two completely diverse questions. Uh, one, uh, with tritium, uh, you talked about the need to contain it, and how difficult is that? Or is that, on the scale of all the other problems, a relatively small problem? And the second thing is, um, especially on your campus and the number of suppliers you're getting and everything, where are you getting, I mean, where are the technologists being bred for all of this? Are our universities here turning out enough physicists, engineers? Because you're, this is beyond theoretical physics now. You, yeah. you need hardcore engineering talent. Yeah. Um, are you getting enough? So for those outside the room, the questions were around um, skills pipeline and um, tritium storage and how difficult that, that problem is. So on, on tritium, first of all, um, the storage of tritium is very well understood using metal hydrides. I mean, it just forms very strong bonds, and you heat it up and it, it releases. The problem with tritium is much more around the permeation through materials, but there are anti-permeation barriers that you can use with sort of palladium membranes and, and we're looking at graphene and other things which can be used for um, anti-permeation barriers. That is a problem, but it's not on the top of the list of technical problems. It's one that I think is, is very much solvable. The, the issue there is, is more around how do you do that in a easily manufacturable way rather than a sort of very bespoke lining and permeation barriers. You want something that's easy to manufacture and low cost because um, there's you know myriad of pipes. So I, th I think that's a very soluble problem actually. Um, then on the skills pipeline, uh, we for sure are now rate limited by skills. Um, our UKAA has grown from about 800 people to a bit over 2,500 in the last four years, but we are rate limited by access to high quality skilled people. Um, we uh, are doing more and more on that. I could have spoken about our apprentice training. We set up an apprentice training center in 2019. In 2019, we did 10. Now we've got 280 learners in school and we have budget to expand that to a thousand learners in school per year by about 2026. So we are trying to do a lot more at apprentice level and also graduate level, PhD level and postdoc level. But um, yeah, we, we for sure need more investment in that space. We're trying to be preemptive, but not really keeping up. Okay. Anyone else in the room? Yeah. When, when you get to construction stage, 
how we can streamline that and reduce the cost of the regulatory structure as well as make the infrastructure for the public money is kind of getting spent on things that environmentally have much greater sure. construction a lot of it's going to have much greater things so how we can reduce that spend the cost as well yeah so the question was about how do you reduce the sort of program management burden of big infrastructure and can we learn from hs2 and indeed other major programs um for sure that is complicated right and this is big infrastructure um so there, there are no easy solutions there um and we are trying our best to learn lessons from those projects and indeed recruiting people from those projects so the program director for step for instance was previously the program director for dreadnought which is our nuclear submarine program it's a 30 billion pound program so um we are trying to bring it bring in people who have major program experience um and you definitely need that for sure because that's what we're doing um uh, equally talking extensively to edf about hinky point and how we can benefit and learn from their development of supply chain and their program management skills and what they're you know, lessons they're learning hard actually on that program so um I, I think the best answer i can give you is to look to what else is going on in the country and try and learn from it but for sure we're going to hit pitfalls and we're going to hit rocks in the road we know we are yeah. just don't know what they are yet <laughs> Can you just um, go over again how the power phase up works? How we extract power from the how you So the question is, how do you extract power from this? So basically, it's like neutrons. It's not very different to fission at that point. So the neutrons come out, they pass through a blanket. That blanket of lithium, it might actually be a lithium compound, um, both slows down the neutrons, yeah. absorbs their energy, heats up. So it's your sort of primary heat transfer and also produces the tritium. So that's multi, yeah. multi focus. But it becomes essentially your primary um, heat transfer, which then heats up a water loop and the water turns into steam, steam turns a turbine, and produces electricity. Mm -hmm. So at that point, so much so different, right? It's the same as conventional plants. It's just and a fancy so, kettle in the middle. So no disrespect to Charles Parsons, but it's a bit we've gone from the mid 20th. 21st century back to the yep. late 19th yep. century, isn't it? Yeah. I remember reading years ago when I was a teenager about the possibility of a, a procedure called M MHD, magnetic hydrodynamics, where you might be able to extract the power directly from the plasma. Is that, do you think that's a possibility at all? No. <laughs> <laughs> So the question was, can you do direct power trans? I mean, it, it, essentially, you have a super of ions and electrons here, right? So can you use the electrons to, to just go down a wire? Um, no, not really, because as soon as you lead to charge differentials between your ions and electrons, then the plasma itself will behave in different ways, and then you'll lose the high heat that you actually need to produce the power in the first place. Um, so it, it's very hard to imagine how you would go about that. I think. The, the primary way is to capture the energy which it resides in neutrons you can't even really extract the heat from the helium because the helium is, is also to carrying a lot of power right it takes a lot of it produces a lot of heat but the helium is both magnetically charged and so feels the magnets it's, it's harder to extract and that's how you keep the fusion reaction going so you plow a load of energy in, in the first place to get it hot but you don't want to keep plowing energy in because then you never produce any so you want to turn off that heat, and you can do that because the helium, which is also very energetic, passes on its 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 energy to the bulk fuel, to the tritium that you're throwing in as ice. So you need to then heat that ice up to high temperatures, and that happens because of the helium. So the helium is used to self-sustain, and the neutrons actually come out, and it's the neutrons which any fusion approach is going to end up capturing the neutrons and producing electricity from. I'm going to ask a question in the room. Um, as I understand it, you've got the fusion on one side of the barrier and the lithium on the other. Yep. And the the neutrons have to pass through that barrier yep. in order to heat the yep. heat the lithium. Yep. Uh, I don't see any way of protecting that barrier from nope. the, from the damage. Correct. And yet that barrier is going to be an integral part. Yes. I don't see how you ever replace it. Ah, so so that you can replace. Yeah. So so um, the bit in the middle. So I, I need a drawing of this really. Um, so you have the, the, the plasma, the fusion fuel, immediately outside that, the first thing the neutrons will hit is the armour, the armour which takes high heat, probably tungsten, moly. Then immediately behind that, you have the lithium blanket, and then you get to the structural stuff. 
So that blanket where all the lithium is stored and you use for your primary heat transfer is not structural. It's armor, it's, it's hung on the steel. So the steel vessel is further out and that, that um, blanket and primary heat transfer is sort of hung off it. Okay. So, so you're right that the neutrons will hit the armor and they will crack it eventually mm -hmm. and they will cause it to swell and, they will, and the heat will cause it to melt. So for sure won't last, it is a consumable part, definitely. We expect the plant will last for many decades because the plant is really the lifetime of the steel, which is out of the back, and the steel will feel fission-like neutrons because they slow down as they go through the blanket and then maybe two MeV or less by the time they get to the steel. So that steel will have the same lifetime as a fission plant, and that's the structure. And that's the thing you never change. All the bit in the middle, you will have to replace. So it becomes okay. a consumable. Oh, so. And then the, the question is how long till you have to replace it, right? And if it's five years, it's fine. You take the lid off, you replace those, 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 the blanket components, and then you put the lid back on and start operating again. Um, but if it's six months and it's cracked and swollen, you need to replace it, then your availability would be terrible and you'd never make power out of that. Because... No, and you wouldn't be able to produce the lithium either. You'd produce the tritium. Well, you'd produce, tritium you'd produce all the tritium that you burn. You'd be self-sufficient, but your availability mm. would be too low. Yeah. yeah. Tim, how are we doing on, on questions um, online? Set of already questions. You want to... I suppose if you want to start with the first one, if you click on chat, oh. um, and then scroll down to 747, there was one from Pat Lidica. Um, so maybe either you could read them or answer them to ask them yourselves. Yeah, 47. That was the first one, I think. Uh. This one, right. From a sustainability perspective, has any work been done on how these plants would be decommissioned? That's a very interesting question. So um, JET, which has operated for 40 years, started in 1983, um, will cease operation at the end of this year. Um, and it then needs to be decommissioned. And it's a UK liability to decommission. And indeed, we are thinking very hard about what we can repurpose, but we will for sure have to decommission the plant. And um, so we are working very actively on a decommissioning plan that will start 1st of January 2024. So we are thinking about that. Um, essentially, the decommissioning happens in three stages. First of all, um, you have to take all the as what Ian was just referring to all the in vessel stuff, the tiles, the blanket components that all needs to come out. And we would do that in the same way that we installed it, which is robotically. So the robot installed all of the tiles on the inside of jet, 16,000 tiles, four tons of metal. It was all installed robotically. So we will robotically disassemble that. That then goes into casks. Those casks go to a deep. So the reason that they're that they come out as intermediate level waste, um, but they're intermediate level waste because of the tritium content largely. So the tritium, because tritium just permeates through things, it gets embedded in the materials. Um, we have now done um, detritiation tests on all of the materials which are on the inside of jet. That's primarily stainless, inconel, tungsten, and beryllium. So we've deliberately impregnated those four metals, put them into a detritiation facility, and, and captured 99.5% of all the tritium. So we know how to detritiate. We have recipes to detritiate that. And then the material comes out, and it's either low level or free to recycle. So um, the plan is you take out those components robotically, you take them to a detritiation facility where they're heated up, you extract the tritium from it, you put the tritium back into storage, and then the material is low-level waste or free to recycle, and you can just recycle it. So those are the first two stages. And then the third stage is that you're left with all the ancillaries, and those ancillaries is just a conventional D-plant, right, like a gas plant or something like that. So it's not especially complicated. It's just big. Um, so yes, we have a we now have a handle on how to decommission things. Um, the next question is why don't you make tritium in a separate plant and save yourself one big headache? Right, um, it's a it's a good question. Unfortunately, um, we will burn a lot of tritium today. There's about fifty five kilos of tritium in the world, most of which is produced by fission plants, um, and indeed that's where we get our startup charge. Um, we will burn something like a kilogram a day um, when we're operating a power plant. So you definitely cannot just use what, what pre-exists. You could have conceived putting a fission plant next to a fusion plant to produce the tritium, but again, it just doesn't produce enough tritium for what you need to burn to produce power at a, a sort of gigawatt scale. So you just have to make it. There's no way of getting around that problem. If you're, if you're not self-sufficient um, because of the short half-life, 
Um, there's just not there's just not enough tritium naturally, so we just have to make it. So nothing's ever free. Um, the next one: Will you be using conventional steam turbines? Yes, although we are looking at using supercritical CO two um, as a coolant, which allows you to then operate at higher temperatures. One of the things that I haven't really talked about um, today is that you know one of our big challenges is that we have too much heat. You know, it's just incredible source of heat. Um, if you come back to my third slide about you know actually affecting global energy consumption um a big chunk of that is really hard to abate stuff like cement production glass production concrete production which needs really high grade heat in, indeed even hydrogen production needs sort of thousand degree plus heat nothing produces that apart from burning fossil fuels today it's the only thing um if you if you were to use renewables to produce thousand degree heat that's phenomenally phenomenally inefficient because <laughs> it produces no heat and you then have to turn it into electricity which in itself is not efficient and then use a lot of electricity to produce thousand degree heat so that sort of co-generation bit of fusion is is actually very appealing because we can run the walls very hot um, our prototype we're aiming at 600 degrees but if we can make better steels we could run run hotter walls as well um, because we just we have so much heat um, and for the really hard to abate stuff I, I think it's kind of the, the, the best way to go, actually. Um, you know, that, that's sort of the, the idea behind advanced fission reactors as well, is to run the walls hot, but fusion has even more heat than fission. Um, da, 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 could you please pray see the... Oh, right. Uh, I tried to do that. Um, decades until commercial fusion power. In the meantime, is there some kind of coordination effort to exploit spin-offs from this work? To keep people interested yeah absolutely um uka's mission is to deliver sustainable fusion power and maximize the economic benefits on that pathway so yeah we really do care about that we can't just say to politicians look jam tomorrow 20 years time we might have a prototype 30 years time we might have a power plant you know i'm afraid our political cycle is such that they're unlikely to invest in that mm -hmm. um if you can show that there are spin-off technologies in the near term as well then in some senses it's not dead money um, and so we, we work very hard on that. Um, let me just give you, I'll just give you one example on the boom robots. So there's very large boom robots that I showed you, which were generated for fusion because it's kind of a fusion application. Nobody else really needed that. Um, we spun out a company to do boom robots, a company called Oxford Technology Limited, um, subsequently been bought by a big French multinational, but they're still mainly in the UK. Um, they recently won the inspection contract for Fukushima, which is a couple hundred million. Because um, you'd, you'd say that the Japanese are very good at robots, and they are, right? Mitsubishi, Toshiba, companies like that. But they didn't know about boom robots. And so they sent in ground-based robots or, or drones, and they just get fried because all the electronics get fried by the radiation. With a boom, you can put all the electronics at the back of the boom, and then the rest of it's mechanical. Um, and so they had to come to the UK to do that because we're the best place in the world for doing it. And so they are now doing inspection-based robots, and they probably will end up doing all the retrieval-based robots too. Um, so there's again, and that's a billions of contracts there. So there's there's real big opportunity on the back of fusion developed technology. Um, I think I've done that one. Uh, as certain materials are increasingly in demand, do you anticipate uh, presenting another commercial challenge? Um, so so lithium. Lithium in raw form, um, we're not, even if we were at the sort of terawatt level, um, like a thousand gigawatt plants, we would be maybe 10% of global demand of lithium. So I'm not, I'm not hugely worried about lithium raw material. However, there is no supply chain for lithium enrichment in the quantities that we need. So as I said before, most of the lithium is lithium seven, and really we want a lot of lithium six. Um, and there are ways of doing that, but largely it's weapons applications that do it at the moment, and they do it on um, a you know, small scale, a few tonnes. We will need hundreds of tonnes to, to do that at scale, and so that means a new supply chain needs to be developed. Now, I'm not scared of that, but it's not quick. It doesn't happen overnight. So we do have to work with other enrichment technologies to, to get them to pivot to doing lithium enrichment as well. Um, it's a question about what is the lifespan. Oh, I should have said, by the way, on, on certain materials, look, for sure there are materials where um, either we don't really find them naturally in the UK or um, or there are other demands for it. Rare earths in the magnets, beryllium in the breeders, 
Um, so things like that. Now, there is plenty of that stuff um, on the scale that we need it, but we don't entirely control our destiny there. So we will be reliant on, and, and tritium is a startup charge. At the moment, we get all of our tritium from Canada. Um, we don't have any tritium in the UK other than stuff we've bought from Canada. Um, so yeah, there are some pinch points. I think all of it's manageable, but but we should acknowledge that there are pin pinch points. What's the lifespan of the prototypes? How would you recycle? I think I've done with the decommissioning. Um, the, the lifespan, I think I sort of answered to Ian's question, I think structurally, the structural materials we would expect to last for many decades, 30, 40 years. The stuff which is uh, near-term facing, I, mean, it, I, I would hope it lasts for a few years, four or five years, but I don't know until we build a prototype, I'm afraid. Um, the heat that was being shown was extracted at the bottom. Will that be sufficient as a generation source? So we don't plan to use that as generation. So that's less high grade heat. So the, the coolant, so that the actual surface feels about 2000 degrees, but the coolant which comes out, maybe 300. So it's something like 300 degree heat. Now for us, that's probably low grade heat. For other power plants, it would be quite high grade. We would certainly expect to use that in some recirculating power in the plant and then into the district for local district heating. Um, fusion also has the benefit of not needing a big nuclear exclusion zone, so it can be much more closely um, closely um, situated, you know, approximated next to um, population centres. And so you could certainly use that for district heating or, or low-grade heat processes. So we will use all, all of it, um, but it's not really suitable for electricity production. Um, how long do you need to maintain plasma stability? Um, well, indefinitely, really. Um, you, you want the plasma to be running all the time. If you're not running all the time, then you're not producing any electricity. So you want it to be running pretty much steady state. If stability breaks down too frequently, won't that wreck your turbines? Yes. So we, we certainly don't want to have too many disruptive events because the turbines don't like being cycled. Um, we will have some disruptions. We will for sure. Something will happen where you lose control. Now, I talked about the flaking of the tungsten. That will happen. We know it will happen. Sometimes that tungsten, either by magnetic force or just gravity, could end up just a flake of tungsten going into the core core fuel. Tungsten is great for high heat flux, but um, it's high atomic number. So when it goes into a hydrogen fuel, it radiates the energy because it's really high atomic number. Um, and so that will very rapidly drop the temperature of the fuel, and then the magnets may not be able to react quickly enough to be able to, to, to keep the confinement. And so you can end up in a situation where you begin to lose confinement of the fuel and you, you essentially have to throw a lot of material in quickly, a lot of gas in quickly to cool it all down so that you don't get preferential melting somewhere. All of that is manageable. We know how to do that. In fact, we do do that in jet. Um, however, it will mean that we stop producing electricity, which means the turbines are stopped. And so we have to run them down. There's some inertia in the systems. I'm not worried about causing a break in the turbine, but they don't like the cycling. So um, we, we definitely can't do that very often. Indeed, we'll probably have some sort of intermediate storage system to deal with that and mitigate that, that effect. Are you okay to keep on? I can keep going for another five minutes if you're not bored. Um, what are the biggest challenges to the modeling of fusion systems and how do we make the best of digital technologies? Uh, such as machine learning and, and twins. Um, yeah, I, I think that the interesting thing is the combination of machine learning and HPC. So um, our we have a huge variation in both length and temporal scales. So things which happen in a plasma happen on a microsecond scale, but obviously you want to model it for hours or days. So you, you have many, many decades to span there. And also the turbulence is happening on a micron scale, but obviously the plant is meters. So you've got to go microns to meters and and um, microseconds to, to seconds or hours. So you've got many decades to scan in both at the same time, which means, frankly, you just need a lot of computational power to be able to model that. So it's like meteorology, right? So it's like big, big HPC that the Met Office use. It's similar sort of length and, and temporal scales. Um, so we need both HPC, but then also we have pretty sparse data sets um, and we would like to apply a greater level of machine learning and indeed uncertainty quantification that we do at the moment i would say in fusion that's pre pretty embryonic we are not vanguard adopters of that we should be <laughs> frankly because i think it would make a big difference so it's it's one of the next frontiers i think in fusion will be um, adoption of machine learning there are some of the private companies who are actually better than us in this space so they've been working with with google you know, um, big early adopters of that so uh, more to come on that 
Um, how do you factor in technology challenge in an evolving sector? Uh, yeah, that's difficult. <laughs> um, so a, uh, high temperature superconductors is a good example of that. Um, had HTC coils existed when ITER was starting to be built, we probably would have adopted them. You know, ITER is now 80% built before we've got a high power, a high temperature superconducting magnet. So um, things do change over decadal projects. Um, we we do try to stay at the vanguard of a lot of these technologies, but there are disruptive things which can happen, and and that is a disruptive thing that's happening in our field at the moment. So, um, yeah, I don't have a very good answer to that. We, like every field, are uh, exposed to disruption. Um, I'm conscious that you probably want me to finish. No, no, uh, I, I'm, I'm worried about you running out of steam. <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not Are there water containing tubes embedded within the solid lithium to extract the heat? Yes, um, probably not water, but yes, there are coolants um, which which circulate within the molten lithium or whatever you might use, either solid or, or molten lithium. Um, and that could be helium. Um, it could be it could be water. It could actually be lithium as well. Yeah. So lots of different approaches to I coolants you'd be that you might the lithium round to uh, uh, heat exchange. Yeah, you you can use molten lithium. You could just just mm. just use straight lithium. Um, we we tend to want to put other things in it like lead or beryllium because they multiply neutrons and then you get more more breeding of tritium because you double the neutrons. Um, and at that point, it may be more optimal to use a, like a ceramic composite or something rather than just pure molten lithium. But there are lots of different approaches to that. So some people advocate flied, um, lots of different different approaches to how blankets might be designed. Um, what does the UK government's aim of having a world leading fusion sector in the UK look like? One that makes some money. Um, I think it's a, it's a combination of have a prototype which is the step program. So, so you, you're taking a punt there and investing in a program to produce um, net electricity and show that you can you can do that in a cost efficient way. And that's the whole, you know, circle talk about more compact plant, deal with the heat. It's it's a sort of advantage that nobody else has tried. So we are, I would say, in the box seat on IP in that. So they're putting a bet on that, but at the same time, establishing centers of excellence in tritium in materials in robotics in fuel in plasmas which apply to all ways of doing fusion so that 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 um multidisciplinary capability is a reason why you're seeing companies relocate to the uk so that they can access that capability the regulatory framework is also another reason why people are coming to the uk so those two things capability and and innovative regulatory framework um, make it an attractive place for companies to locate and you are seeing we genuinely are seeing inward investment so general fusion is a good example canadian company raising money coming to the uk they've already placed a contract for all of their steels fabrication with sheffield forge masters they just wouldn't have done that and that's a 70 million pound contract they wouldn't have done that unless they were coming to access our, our capability and, and regulatory framework so we are seeing inward investment it is making money in the near term it is paying back the exchequer as well as taking a longer term bet on a prototype. Well, I think on that very positive note, we probably <laughs> should call it a call it a night. Thank you so much. I I think I'm most appreciative of the fact you you certainly didn't understate the difficulties. You know, you, there are difficulties, um, but um, it's good to see the optimism uh, that these difficulties can be faced and perhaps surmounted before very long. So, can we just have a round of applause for one? Thank you very much and thank you to everyone online. I will close the meeting now. Okay, thank you.